you for an opportunity to present my paper at this conference. Um, and it's, privilege, it's, a, it's a privilege to be with a group of distinguished scholars um, on the studies of Chinese political economy. So my paper is joint work with my colleague Xiao Jing Li and the Department of Political Science and the University of British Columbia. And in this paper, we try to look at uh, the perceptions on the Chinese firms with regard to the benefits and risks of the BRI and uh, their decision to join the, the initiative or not. So just as a little bit of background, the BRI was first designed, first launched in, 19, in 2013 uh, as an initiative to redirect uh, excess domestic capacity and capital for regional infrastructure development and to improve China's relations with partner countries. And since then, it has re-emerged as a centerpiece of Beijing's foreign and economic policy. Our previous studies have looked at the strategic and uh, economic motivations behind the BRI. Uh, for example, uh, it has been suggested that through the BRI policy, China is engaging in efforts to enhance the country's energy security and improve relations with partner countries. Uh, it highlights Beijing's strategic economic statecraft designed to incentivize governments in East Asia, in Asia, to pursue greater cooperation with Beijing through the use of a major financial carrot uh, to fill the region's existing infrastructure gap. And if successfully implemented, uh, the initiative may help deepen regional economic integration and increase trade and investment flows between the region and the outside world. And this may help to elevate the importance of Beijing as a, center of ma a major center of trade and investment activities in the region. So, um, and, and as well, the BRI promises to deliver considerable economic benefits for Beijing. For instance, it has been suggested that the BRI may help to China to export its excess capacity, uh, channel its foreign exchange reserve uh, from, the, um, uh, from low interest bearing American government securities to infrastructure development. Uh, in addition, the project may help to reduce investment waste in SOE-dominated public sector, uh, help to stabilize employment, as well as the overall economy. Um, despite these um, presumed benefits and, uh, uh, of the BRI, however, studies have also highlighted some potential risks of the project. These include uh, political risks, uh, the fact that a lot of the host governments are, uh, have a high level of corruption, other risks such as legal and regulatory, and risks in areas such as government effectiveness, political instability, uh, and sovereign risks. And then lastly, uh, many of the uh, projects uh, seem to have poor economic rationale, and this is reinforced by concerns about the dubious track record of Chinese investors. So in this study, we seek how to understand the impact of state investment, uh, the, the, the impact of state control on the um, decision of the firms uh, to engage in investment in BRI countries. And to start with, we engage in the current literature on the use of economic statecraft. Um, to the extent that BRI is, is an example of China increasingly turning to the use of economic statecraft to achieve its foreign policy goals, it's reasonable to argue that it's fundamentally the domestic firms that are involved in carrying out the plan on the ground. So in this sense, the success of the DBRI depends crucially on the degree of state control, that is the degree of the state to di direct the behavior of self-interested firms by shaping their in incentive structure. Uh, when the goals of the state and those of the firms converge, state control is easy, but when they diverge, uh, the state needs to find ways to either compel or control the firms into behaving in a way that serves the strategic interests of the state. And so here we argue that an important way to facilitate this is through ownership control. And we identify several reasons why state ownership can facilitate state control. Right. So the first of these is that as the uh, SOEs, as their names implies, are more likely to share the state's goals. Uh, as the SOEs share strong connections with the government, this means that instead of 
uh, engaging in purely prof profit maximizing activities. Uh, these firms may also make economic decisions that reflect the broader social or economic uh, such as taking an excessive worker, uh, promoting economic, domestic economic development, uh, fostering the growth of strategic or infant industries, or assisting in the uh, achievement of China's overall foreign policy goals. So um, as SOEs face stronger incentives to meet political mandates, it's reasonable to expect that they should be more likely to follow the government's lead and invest in DRI countries. And still a second factor that reinforces the government's control over the SOEs has to do with its strong influence with the company's financial, operational, and managerial decisions. And this was primarily reflected in the fact uh, that the government has uh, provided a wide range of support uh, to SOEs, such as subsidies for low and to no interest loans in the past. In, in the past. Mm -hmm. And then the lastly, um, the government exerted strong personnel and uh, strong control over the SOEs uh, through shareholder control and personnel appointment. So we argue that as a confluence of these, act, of these factors, uh, there existed close symbiotic and clientelistic relationship between the uh, state and SOEs. Uh, and, and as a result of that, uh, large state controlled companies and financial institutions should be more likely to occupy a central role as an initiative. And this is in part borne out by uh, some of the uh, anecdotal evidence that we have seen uh, during the, uh, uh, since the launch of the BRI. For example, between 2014 and 2017, uh, SOEs have made investments or participated in about 1,700 project, BRI projects. And some of the most active um, um, and, and the total Chinese investment uh, along the BRI route amounted to about $6.6 .6 billion or 13.7% of Chinese total outward foreign direct investment. Um, most of the uh, investment went into leading sectors such as infrastructure development, energy exploitation, and the creation of industrial parks. And some of the key actors along the building road path are state-backed giants whose acronyms often start with the letter C. All right, so in our survey, we asked little questions to try to tap the company's uh, perceptions of the risks and benefits involved in, in the BRI, as well as their decision to join the initiative. Um, to see if the SOEs are indeed more likely to participate in the BRI than non-SOEs, we implemented a random survey of firm executives between April and July of 2017. Uh, the survey was conducted through a uh, online marketing research firm, uh, which uh, has recently become a cost-effective tool for subject recruitment in China. Uh, the company uh, collect, has collected basic demographic information on all of its over 2.6 million subjects, uh, make it possible to directly survey at per particular subsample on the subject pool. And for our purposes, we fielded the survey to the subject pool of managers defined as those holding managerial positions, uh, such as general managers, vice presidents, directors, and CEOs. And we used an opting method uh, in our subject recruitment, that is to say, uh, all of the potential respondents uh, received an invitation to take part in the survey and the survey link expired once the preset set number of responses was reached. So this has made it difficult to calculate response rate as would be done with traditional surveys. And in total, 569 firm managers have successfully completed the survey. Uh, the, um, the firms are fairly diverse in terms of their geographical lo uh, location, ownership type, and sectoral, compos sectoral composition, as well as size. Uh, in addition, the firms are fairly diverse, uh, have, have, have had considerable international exposure. Uh, for example, about 31% of them owns a facility or has investment in another country, and 50% and 73% have imported uh, were exported in the past year, respectively. And we also compared an attribute 
compare both in our sample with those of more of more representative national samples, such as the um, uh, China Chinese um, uh, foreign firm. Uh, uh, firm level industrial statistics uh, that was released in 2013. Uh, this was represented in column A of this table here. And uh, the attributes, as we can see, the attributes of the firms in our sample are broadly similar to those of the uh, CFIS. So the first set of questions uh, to begin our uh, inquiry, are uh, we first uh, try to explore the effect of state ownership on Chinese firms' perceptions of the benefits and challenges of BRI participation. And specifically, we asked the respondents whether or not they thought BRI policies would have a positive effect on the economic and long-term development of their firms in a number of areas. And so this figure here presents the percentage of managers from SOEs and non-SOEs who selected each of the eight areas, which are marked or ranked in descending order according to the overall percentages. So um, here it is noteworthy that um, the, manage, uh, the preferences of the SOEs or um, non-SOEs are broadly uh, similar, especially with regard to the top five areas of benefits. Uh, their opinions began to diverge uh, with regard to the bottom three items, uh, with the SOEs more concerned about raising product quality, uh, while the uh, non-SOEs more concerned about lowering labor and other costs of the BRI. Um, Non-SOE managers were least concerned about uh, raising product, um, uh, product quality. And the most surprising finding uh, from this figure is that while an important goal of the BRI for the state is to export ex excess capacity, uh, firms did not consider this to be an area in which they would benefit the most. And, um, in, uh, and instead, uh, the firms uh, consider pri uh, uh, such priorities such as expanding to foreign markets, promoting value chain integration, and acquiring new technology, raising productivity much higher than exporting excess capacity. Uh, this, this result suggested that the primary benefits firms hope to reap through the BRI may be increasingly, increasingly moving away from more traditional goals in line with official state uh, policy and instead are reflecting their own uh, commercial interests in overseas market expansion through value chain integration or technological upgrade. So we now turn to the challenges of the BRI. Uh, similar to the question above, we asked managers to identify the biggest obstacles and challenges that might prevent their firms from investing in BRI countries. So um, here, uh, in this figure here, uh, we present the percentages of managers from SOEs and non-SOEs who selected each of the nine items, which are ranked in descending order according to the overall percentages. So here we see more divergence between the two, group of firm, two, two groups of firms. In particular, non-SOEs were more concerned about being unfamiliar with the investment environment uh, in the host country than were SOEs. Uh, they also worry about the possibility of policy changes leading them to sink money into BRI countries only hit by, to be hit by changes in the Chinese government's policy priorities later. SOEs, however, uh, paid more attention to bilateral relations between China and the host countries. However, despite these preferences, both SOEs and non-SOEs agreed that the top three challenges are poor investment environment, host country political instability um, and linearity with the host country investment environment. And it suggested that um, state ownership has no discernible effect on the firm's perception of the potential challenges of, and benefits of BRI participation, uh, which differ considerably from the stated goals of the state. Now, um, is this is also the case that the, um, the goals of the 
uh, SOE and uh, non-SOEs converge when it comes to the decision to invest in BRI countries. Uh, to investigate this possibility, uh, we presented, we asked the firm managers whether they have plans to join the BRI uh, part partition by firm ownership type. So for this question, firms were presented uh, with four possible answers, including yes, no, wait and see, and never heard of the BRI. And as we can see in this figure here, almost 60% of the SEC managers surveyed stated that their firms had plans to participate in the initiative uh, more than three times the, uh, as many as those choosing to, uh, choosing to stay out. And in comparison, only 35% of the non-SOE managers uh, stated that they had plans to participate in the BRI. And the pattern stays the same when we break down non-SOEs into private, into different uh, ownership uh, types. Uh, for example, 47% 40, of uh, the managers of private firms compared to 45% of those of foreign enterprises, 40% of collective enterprises, and 42% of, um, of joint venture, of managers of joint venture stated that they did not have any plans uh, to stay in the uh, BRI. And the number, the share, the pr proportion of managers of joint ventures who stated that they had no, they, they do have plans to participate in the BRIs is relatively high, potentially because of the, um, because of the fact that the state owns shares and domestic shares in many of these enterprises. So um, overall, the argument is, um, sorry about that. So um, overall, the findings are uh, strongly consistent with our key argument that the SOEs were much more likely to express their willingness to participate in the BRI despite uh, sharing uh, similar preferences with non-state firms. Uh, this once again highlights the importance of state control in the exercise of economic statecraft. Uh, to further buttress our analysis, we conducted a multinomial analysis of the, of the determinants of firm participation in the BRI. Uh, here, we first looked at a, a dichotomous variable for whether a firm is a state firm or a non-state firm. Uh, this is the uh, model two. We further moved on to uh, break down the non-SOEs into different ownership types. Um, and in analysis, we included a set of uh, control variables that may also be relevant for understanding uh, firms' decision to engage in internationalization via the BRI, including uh, firm size, productivity, uh, the firm's trading profile, uh, the extent to which they're engaged in foreign investment activities, uh, political connections, and whether the firm is in the infrastructure industry. So the results are once again broadly consistent with the argument uh, in both model one and model two. We, we see that non-state firms uh, uh, state that they are less likely to participate in the BRI compared uh, to state firms. And in terms of the control variables, uh, the analysis finds uh, substantial evidence for an argument uh, for, for, uh, for, for variables and, uh, for argument emphasizing the importance of uh, the size of the firm, productivity, uh, their trade investment profile, and political connections. And some, some, somewhat surprisingly, we did not find any evidence supporting uh, an argument about infrastructure industry. It's not necessarily the case that firms in infrastructure industry are more likely uh, to participate in the BRI. So those are some of our uh, main findings. And just to quickly wrap up this discussion, our uh, analysis suggested that uh, while both state and non-state firms see similar opportunities and risks investing in the BRI, uh, their stated preferences uh, follow economic rather than political logic, um, uh, um, and thus are substantially different from the priorities uh, laid out by the state. Uh, nevertheless, SOEs are much more likely than their non-state counterparts to support the BRI and express willingness to participate in the initiative. 
So these um, results once again highlight the importance of state control in, uh, in the exercise of economic statecraft. And this finding really raises questions about the degree to which the uh, Chinese state can indicate the support of all of its firms in the execution or the implementation of BRI projects. Um, and this uh, raises con concerns about uh, the pr uh, problem, the potential for more hazard. Uh, in other words, SOEs may be more likely to invest in risky and large scale projects in BRI countries, knowing that it will be bailed out by the state should the investment project fail. And uh, this may uh, lead to potential concerns about efficiency losses for the government in the long term. And our finding additionally, just as an uh, auxiliary finding of our analysis, this is not present in the finding here, uh, we break down uh, the uh, firms by, by their size, and we find that there's a systematic difference between the large uh, SOEs and the small and medium-sized enterprises, especially in those in the private sector. Uh, private firms and small and medium-sized firms are at a distinctive, distinctive disadvantage. They are less likely to indicate that they have willingness to participate in the project. So this suggests that uh, it may be important for Beijing to enhance the participation of non-state firms in order for the BRI to better, better realize its full potential. And uh, as a matter of fact, private enterprises possess considerable dynamism and flexibility. Uh, they, are more, they, 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 should, they, they can more easily adapt to local circumstances and their development experience may also prove useful for developing countries along the BRI route as they search for a viable path for, uh, to sustain economic growth. So this uh, re reinforces the importance for the government to come up with policy, um, uh, policy proposals or policy initiatives to assist in the participation of these firms in the, uh, in the project. And then lastly, our um, policy, our paper has implications for the use of infrastructure investments as tools for of economic statecraft beyond China. Uh, for example, in 2018, the Trump administration has unveiled plans to encourage private investment into energy and infrastructure sectors in the Asian Pacific region, um, uh, potentially to counter the influence of uh, China in the BRI regions. However, with, without the kind of leverage that Beijing holds over its OSOEs through state ownership, it remains to be seen whether Washington can come uh, in. Can I cut you off there? I think we're running into the Q&A time. Yes, that's my last sentence. Yes, I'm done. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, Yemen has a question. Yemen, do you want to un unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, okay, so I'll be very, very, uh, very quick. It's a uh, clarification. Uh, so your uh, your uh, statistical results uh, are based on the survey or actual data. Um, I think in 2017, when you were doing the survey, then there were uh, the data was very uh, limited. But by uh, by now the the data actual firm investment data uh, is uh, is quite rich. So I want to uh, clarify whether your uh, your your study uh, has actual data or it's just a survey, because that uh, and so relate to this um, your thoughts on the infrastructure industry not showing significant uh, sign uh, is that the survey or it's the data? Thanks. Very good presentation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the questions. Yeah, I mean, so to just to clarify, our survey is an actual survey of the companies um, located in China. So this is not um, a study of the ob observational data. I mean, though the observational data have may have become increasingly available in recent years. Um, uh, this, is, this is not the purpose of our study. So our study is mainly interested in tapping the perceptions and, and, and uh, perceptions uh, and attitudes, preferences of the firms that are actually on the ground. Um, so uh, that's with regard to the uh, data. And then the second has to do with 
Uh, the question about infrastructure development, I'm not sure if it's specifically uh, our, our finding of non-significance for the infrastructure industry. Uh, I'm not sure if this is um, uh, mainly because of the data. As I, as I mentioned before, our, chem, our, our sample composition is fairly uh, comparable to those of nationally representative sample. Um, we compare you know, the sample composition to the China firm level in the industrial industrial survey uh, that which was conducted by the government in 2013. Uh, our uh, sample firms are fairly comparable with uh, those in the CFIS in terms of their geographical location, the industries and all, so on and so forth. So I'm not necessarily sure that uh, the bias, you know, the uh, sample composition may have introduced the bias to our analysis. Okay, I, I have a, a couple comments about the difference between private firms and SOEs and how to interpret that. And so I, I want to ask um, uh, Lee maybe to, um, you, have a, you have a long comment in chat, but why don't you just articulate it to the, directly? Uh, okay, uh, so uh, thanks very much for the presentation. I actually read the paper that you published on this a few weeks back. Um, and I wonder whether the results support your, the results are really interesting, but I do wonder whether they support your central claim that it shows the state controls SOE investment practices. So looking at your correlations, you found that SOEs and private firms had very similar views of the BRI, which were very much focused on economic issues, not political ones. You didn't find any correlation between SOEs propensity to invest in the BRI and whether they were actually in a BRI province or if their leaders sit on the NPC, which I thought undermined the political control argument. And I thought the fact that SOEs and private companies are, have different levels of participation could be quite easily explained by their different access to policymakers and credit um, in the sense that 96% of construction contracts and 72% 70, of investment projects have gone to SOEs because they can very easily access credit. So a different way of reading this data is to say that um, it's not that the state is telling SOEs where and uh, what to invest in, but rather SOEs are able to bandwagon on the BRI to extract resources from the state to expand their uh, business interests overseas, which they perhaps would like to do anyway. Yeah. Thank you for the question. I guess that's part in part embedded uh, in our argument. You know, one of the key, one of the one of our key arguments uh, with regard to the connections between the state and and uh, the firms was that the government is more likely to exert, to be able to exert influence over the company uh, through its financial, uh, through its ability uh, to influence the financial decisions. I talked about the subsidies and the no low or no cost loans that the government frequently provided to the SOEs. And so as a result of uh, this strong financial ties, it's very natural that it's not surprising that the non-SOEs are more likely to receive, the SOEs are more likely to receive more funding uh, than the non-SOEs um, uh, to participate but, in the- But if market. I may, if I may just interrupt, you could sure. flip this on its head and, and talk about, instead of state-owned enterprises, you can talk about an enterprise-owned state. Now, that's obviously overstating it. But my point here is simply that the fact that companies are able to get cash from the state to subsidize their overseas expansion does not illustrate that the state controls these enterprises. That on its own is not, is not signif sig does not signify state control over their operational and managerial decisions. It can arguably be the other way around. Particularly, and this links in with your point about moral hazard, that when these companies are very powerful in the system, are able to extract resources from the state, and there's very limited oversight and poor regulation of these investment decisions, that's really what fuels moral hazard. Um, the fact that the, 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 the companies, I guess these are the same side, you know, two sides of the same coin. Right. On the one hand, then the government is able to influence the uh, firm's decisions. Uh, but on the other hand, on the other hand, the, the firms were able to get these credits. They were able to extract the credits from the government primarily because of their strong connections with the government. 
So it's kind of hard to really distinguish between, you know, whether it is in the government that was able to influence over the state or whether it is the, uh, it is the uh, firms that were able to extract the credits from the government. So I kind of consider this as two sides from the same coin. Uh, the fact that they have strong ties implied that firms were more likely to be able to get credits and other preferential access uh, to government policy, which then enabled their BRI participation. So I'm not sure if I understand your question uh, well, clearly. Can, can, I, can I jump? I mean, just to, not to gang up so much, but I mean, if it was really that uh, the government is using this as leverage and the firms are doing the BRI because they want to get kind of uh, access to credit from the state, then they should have said that they care. The reason they want they they want to do BRI is because they want lower cost of credit, right? And the fact that they they don't seem to they seem to be thinking about the same things as the private firms. So it doesn't seem like preserving the state relationship is what's driving their decision about or their views about the Belt and Road. The preserving credit, low cost of credit. Uh, I mean, it is part of the states, you know, the firms are likely uh, to gain access and you just compare to the non-SOEs, the SOEs are more likely to be able to have access to uh, government uh, credit. Uh, so that's their main priority. And uh, this is a part of the um, uh, influence exerted by you know, the financial leverage. And as a result of the government's financial leverage, the firms were uh, more likely to gain preferential access um, and so this is uh, uh, in part what enabled these firms, you know, participation uh, in the BRI, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, close connections that they have with the government um, made it, simply made it possible for that access to happen.